now you can be seated. Man, what, a, what an awesome uh, experience to be in something like this. Don't, don't, don't take this for granted. This took a long time to get here. I want to preach to you a message, and, and this is the title. Um, and I, because I think I got the right crowd. I think I got the right crew. Um, the title is simply this. I love my church. You can see it on the sides right over there. Is there anybody that that is true for you? Uh, here's the deal, Pastor. I, I'm a pastor. So I've been a pastor for seven years, and I don't even know if I could even say I'm a pastor yet when 16 years, 17 years. I mean, God, help us. Come on, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not necessarily an evangelist. I'm not here to just preach a nice message and, 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 and get everybody excited. And I'm, I'm not that that's, there's not moments for that. Uh, tonight, I want to preach a message that is going to help this house. And, and I want to preach a message that will further this house. And so tonight, if it's okay, I'm just preaching to you what I'm preaching to my church. And we're in a series right now simply titled, I Love My Church. Would you help me and just say that one time just so we can let the devil know he is a liar and he's still under our feet. On the count of three, would you just say those words with me? Ready? One, two, three. I Yeah, someone back there believes it right there. I heard someone back in that back row just, I love my church. You should say it with some attitude. You should say it with some spirit. You should, I love, for, for, every, time, for every, every time the devil tries to get you to hate on God's bride, for every time the, the devil tries to get you to hate the army that will help set you free when you don't know how to find freedom yourself. For every time God tries to rip you out of his garden. For every time God, the enemy tries to dislocate you from the body. Uh, you, you should say it one more time. I love my church. For every time you've thought of talking bad about his church, for every time you've thought that offense could remove you from his church, you should say it one more time. I love my church. Come on, someone should stand up and just yell it from the top of their lungs. I love my church. And I love my church because it's not just my church. It's his church. And there is someone shouting louder than me. See, it was Jesus that shouted with both hands, stretch across the universe. I love my church. I love her so much that I would die for her. And not that I would, I did. And I died not to stay dead, but to resurrect. Because I want to give my bride that same resurrection power. I love my church. I'm a pastor because I love his church. And there's an attack on our generation that is trying to get us to not love his church. We love Jesus. We love the Holy Spirit. We love God. But I don't know about the church. No one's mad at Jesus. How can you be mad at him? He died for us. He gave his life for us. No one's mad at God. No one's mad at the Holy Spirit. No one's hating on miracles. But all over the world, the enemy is trying to sow division in the church. He's trying to divide the church. He's trying to get us to go, I can do church by myself. Hmm. See, Jeremy, I'm the house of the living God. Yes, you are. But you're just a brick in the house. You're a stone, a living stone in the house. Yes, you are right. You are the house of God. And you do have a relationship with the Father. Yes, he did tear the veil from the top to the bottom. Uh, it wasn't someone on the bottom that ripped it. It was God who ripped open the veil and said, come on in. I want to spend time with you. I want to love on you. It was God who called me out all by myself. It's called the gospel. It reached me when I couldn't get up. 
It grabbed me. I was a dead branch on the side of the road with no life. It was God's hand, the, the gardener who grabbed me. But he said, in order to give you life, I have to cut the vine on the cross. But really to give you life, I have to place you into the vine. And life will come through the vine in the garden of God. See, we are stones in the house of God. Peter, his name was, was Simon, which meant broken reed. Jesus, when he saw him, he said, I'm going to give you a new name. Simon meant broken. He said, I'm going to call you Cephas, which in another language means Peter or rock. You are a rock. You are a stone in the house of God. But don't forget we're building off of the cornerstone. His name is Jesus. And he laid his life down for this thing that we're doing right now. He laid his life down so that we could build upon this. The cornerstone was the first stone that you laid down. Everything else would be measured upon the cornerstone. I measure my life with him. I am connected to God, but I am connected to God with a family that's connected to God. You can't, let me say it this way, you can't do Jesus by yourself. You, you can't just get with him only by yourself. That is one level of anointing because my Bible says where two or three are gathered together in one place, there I am with them. There is a special anointing that shows up or power or authority or release that shows up. It's not me who is going to threaten the gates of hell. It's the church that's going to threaten the gates of hell. Come on, do we have the church? I, I hope I'm preaching to the choir. Do we have the church in the building today? We are built into this house. It's a brick house. It's an amazing house. This is not a social club for perfect people. This is not a gathering. This is not a hangout. This is not a feed me table. This is a place where we serve. This is a place where we labor. This is, this is the workers that are going to go into the harvest field. This is us pulling off the side of the road, gassing up our tank to head back out. This is a home for the broken. It's a hospital for the hurting. This is a place. Look, look the church is not a swipe right relationship. Oh, that's one's nice. People come up to me, Pastor, all the time. Hey, I'm just here, you know, oh, praise God, I'm so glad you're here. You look awesome. And, and how do you, you look like whole and healthy? And uh, I, I love you to serve. And, and then they'll say things like this. Oh, we're just checking this out. And you know what I used to go, oh, okay, I'm sorry, and try to perform better. Because <laughs> they're just checking me out. I said, that's weird. You're a dude. You're checking me out. I don't know what's happening here. And I've learned to just say this back. Well, good, because I'm checking you out. Are you able to hang in this crew? Because this is a crew of warriors. We're not here for transactional moments. We, we, we just, we're here because we're, we're the army of God. We are planted in the, the house of God. See, see churches, I've, lear I've learned as a pastor that church, is, it is a community. It's a community. But it's not meant to be a consumer community. I'm, I'm going to say some things because I'm only here one week, and God bless you. But this is what I'm saying to my church. This is not a consumer community. Because this is not supposed to be a consumer relationship. Can you imagine if I told my wife who I'm married to, hey, honey, so nice to be in this consumer relationship with you. She's not here, but I can already feel the weight of her frustration all the way. No, this, this is a community, but it's a, it's a covenant community. Consumer goods, as long as the product is good, I'll still show up. And I'll even show up for a while because I really believe that one day you'll give me what I'm looking for. 
that's not what this is. We're not here to check this out. We're, we're not here to just check off our box. This is a family. Th th this right here is a covenant relationship. This is when it goes deeper, when we get into covenant with each other. You say, what's a covenant? Well, well consumer relationships, you sign contracts. When I got married before the state, I signed a contract. But that contract isn't my real commitment. My real commitment was when I said before God and man, I promise to love you in sickness and in health, for richer or for poor. I made a covenant with the Lord and my wife and man, and I said the contract, I mean, the first time when we do marriages, sometimes I forget to sign the contract as the pastor for them. And, and then they call me later, we're on a honeymoon, pastor. We're not legally married. And I said, well, you made a covenant before God, so let's not worry about it. We'll sign the contract later. With a, with a covenant, with a contract you sign. With a covenant you seal. Wasn't it the Holy Spirit? that sealed us? Wasn't it God who sealed us through the Holy Spirit? See, when God made a, when God made a community with us, when God began relationship with us, he didn't sign it. He sealed it. You say, what does that matter? Because the seal bore the image of the king. It also bore the authority of the king. And it bore the possession of the king. In their time, the seal was used for lumber that would be cut down from the mountains and flow down the stream. And when you purchased the lumber, you would seal it. I bought that. And you could pick it up at any time you wanted because it was yours. If you wanted to know whose it belonged to, you just look at the image that has been sealed on the piece. His image has been sealed on the peace. He has made a covenant relationship with me. See, let me. Let me tell you this. There were two disciples. Remember Peter? And then there was Judas. They both heard the sermon. They both saw the miracles. They both watched the fish multiply. They both saw him steal the storm. But one made it and the other didn't. What was the difference? They both had community. One was covenant and one was consumer. If you have a consumer relationship with God's bride, you will miss the real power that exists here for you because he wants to put his image on you. He wants to give you his authority. Did you know the tomb that Jesus was buried in was sealed with the king's seal. Do you know now how powerful it is when the tomb was rolled away, when the stone was rolled away? Because what it meant is that there was a higher authority than the governmental authority in the land. That there was a higher power than death. That there was a higher power than failure. That gets me excited. Because he not only rolled away the tomb for me, he rolled away death. He rolled away its sin. It's, look, I was, I was in a covenant relationship with sin. No matter what it did, no matter what bargain it held up to, I was there for the party. Why not be in a covenant relationship with God? If you could have been in a covenant relationship with sin, it's time to switch it and be in a covenant. Don't be in a consumer relationship with God in a covenant relationship with your past. It's time that the church of Jesus Christ rises up and says, I love my church. Church is messy because it's not an organization. It's not a business. It's an organism. It's alive. And if you're a parent, you understand one thing. Anything alive and growing is messy. My house, we got three kids. I love them to death. Sometimes I'm asking God, you have to resurrect this kid after I kill him. 
I got ADHD and so does my son. Praise God. I love, but anything alive is messy. If you signed up for sterile, perfect, clean church, then you want business church. You want organized religion. Not me. Give it to me messy. Give it to me wild. I need some broken people next to me. If there's not enough broken people, this is no longer the emergency room. Look, see, if this is the emergency room, God's going to need some great physicians to rise up and say, God, we're going to take care of broken people. We're going to love them. Look, don't, look, let me tell you this. Don't trust anything that has not been tested. Look, don't go get on a, a new plane that they've never tested. Please don't do that. Don't drive a new car that drives itself that hasn't been tested for all of our sake. Make sure it's been in the lab. Make sure it's been reworked. Make sure it's been tore apart and built back up. Make sure it's gone through a few things. Yet, yet we have this love of God, and we've been given it. We have this righteousness, and we've been given it. And we don't want it to be tested. How do I know that? Because every time I get next to someone who hurts me, I'm trying to run. And God's trying to test his love in me. To show me how bad his love is, how deep his love is, how wide his love is, how powerful his love is. Have you got to experience the depths? You won't find it anywhere other than this is God's petri dish. This is God's, who, who can relate? Who can, who can amen that? Man, I, I've got to test God's love in church. If you haven't had church hurt, you don't know hurt yet. See, often that's the pit that God finds me in. But let me show you, my love can reach down there. My love can pull you back up when someone's rejected you again. My love can pull you back up when it's the most powerful force. But it has to be tested. So God says, you're going to test it. I'm going to allow that person to walk right past you and not say hi. I'm going to allow you to get picked third for the serving position you really desired. I'm going to allow that person that irritates you to be your leader in church. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you guys are laughing too hard. Stop that. They're going to find out. Because before anybody can get on this flight with you, I have to test the equipment. I have to test. Maybe your testing was so God could fill up your flight. Maybe God was allowing you to be tested because he's got a big dream for your life, a big vision for your life. Look, those that can handle the little things get to walk into the big things. See, because I was tested back here, I can trust God over here. I want a worldwide ministry, God. No, you don't. You can't handle a person next to you ministry. I stopped praying for things like that. I know it's coming anyways. God, help me deal with the person next to me. Or maybe the person I'm seeing in the mirror. Help me love him. Help me believe that you called him. Can we go deeper? The church is important to God. Ephesians 1.20 says this, all of this energy. Somebody say energy. Come on, say it like the word means. Ready? One, two, three. Energy. All of this energy issues from Christ, who God raised from the dead and set him in throne in deep heaven. I love that. Sounds like a Star Wars movie or something. In charge of running universes, everything from galaxies to governments. 
No name, no power is exempt from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all. He has the final word on everything. In other words, he's the boss. So let me tell you, because whatever the boss is working on is the most important thing. He's in charge of it all, but he doesn't always touch it all. Usually the boss, his hands are on the most important thing in the entire space. And look at what this says. At the center of all this, Christ, the boss, rules the church. The church you see is not peripheral to the world on the outside looking in. The world should be peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks, he acts, and by which he fills everything with his presence. God, I want you to speak to me. Well, go get involved over there. Go join that, that, that group over there. Go, go do the marriage thing. God, I want you to speak to me. Come on, get, get off work and make sure you're there on Sunday. But, but, but God, I want you to speak to me. Can't you speak to me? Well, I'm, I'm in my church, and it's where I speak is in my church. Uh, God, I want you to fill my life with, with good things. It, I, it's how I feel. It's through the church. Uh, God, I, I want you to act. I want to see miracles, signs, and wonders. I act through the church. You know why? Because it's my body. It's my hands. It's my feet. Yet we want to be the thumb all by ourselves. We're just thumbing around over here. Man, me and Jesus, we have that good time, man. I go to church every once in a while. I mean, I go to 15 churches, but like there's a couple that I really like. Whichever one will let me sing on that Sunday, I just, oh, sorry, I'm just talking to myself. Just thumbing around over here and just really experience. I've experienced God more out of church than in church. Well, I don't know if that's the right God you're experiencing because he, he acts and he speaks and he moves through his body. Look, a dislocated thumb. What is a dislocated thumb without the eyes? What are the eyes without the nose? Someone at my church recently said, man, Pastor, I love this church, but I'm just the only one here. Like me. I said, Awesome. I really need you. He said, really? I said, yeah. Look at my body. I said, I only got one nose. But thank God for that nose. I'm so glad my nose hasn't looked around my body and said, wow. I mean, there are no other noses here. If there was but another nose, I could feel really comfortable in this body. No, the nose goes, wow, if there's only one of me, I must be special. God must have brought me to the right place at the right time. I'm just going to breathe a little. Well, there's only two of me. I got two eyes. A whole body that's an eye? That's weird. That's a character on Monsters, Inc., but maybe that's why the world is afraid of the church. Because we look more like the bride of Frankenstein than the bride of Christ. Man-made, dead, put together with old extra parts, and has to be shocked once a week to wake up. Not this church. This church is the bride of Christ. Not this church. This church is getting ready for his second coming. Not this church. Come on, we're practicing for what it's going to look like in heaven. Not this church. Because I love, I love my church. Can we go deeper? Psalms chapter 92, verse number 12. I love this verse, Pastor. It says, the righteous. Do we have any righteous in the house today? The righteous shall flourish like the palm. 
He shall grow up like the cedars of Lebanon. Those that be, those that be, I like that. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring forth fruit, wow, in old age. There's nothing better than someone who grows spiritually and they got fruit. There's nothing worse than someone who grows physically and has no fruit. You know that old angry usher? You never met him. Or that old angry praiser? You never met him. Because not in this church. Because in this church, we have people that are planted. In this church, we have people producing fruit till they go home and be with Jesus. In this church, we don't, we don't retire, we refire. Come on, in this church, we got some fired up people that are young at heart. Amen? We got people that are dying their hair to look cool and dying their hair to look normal. We got people on the walker and the skateboard in this church. The righteous shall flourish like the palm. He shall grow up like the cedar. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. I like that word, but as a guy, I thought flourish, I, you know, I'm not real excited about that word. It's not like the tattoo I want on me, flourish. So I looked up the word because I said there's got to be some reasoning why this is exciting. And the word literally means this, a living organism that grows or develops in a healthy and vigorous way, especially as the result of a particularly favorable environment. Other words that would be similar to this are grow, thrive, prosper, develop, multiply, shoot up, bloom, bear fruit. Come on, those that are planted in the house of the Lord will grow vigorously, will thrive, will prosper, will develop, will increase, will multiply. Come on, God, I want to multiply. Get planted in the house. When you get planted in the house of the Lord, it's your promise. Well, I'm here, pastor. I'm here. We come to church, come to Wednesday night, revival, come on. Amen. We come, and we're here in the revival. We're here on Wednesday night revival, and together, I forgot my, my friend, my partner. Where'd he go? Where'd my buddy go? Oh, there you are. We just come in. Man, I'm not, I'm not really here to, I don't know if I'm here for long. I'm just, I'm, I'm here, and I've had some growth. He's had some, a lot of growth. Wow. Praise God for you. Uh, it's good to have friends. Iron sharpens iron. It's good to have friends that are already producing flowers and all kinds of things. Man, it's good to be here. And how are you doing? I'm glad. I'm glad to be here. What is this church called? Way, way, the way, the way, the way, the truth, and the life. I like that. I like that. I might stay at this church. It, it, how many steps does it take to get involved here? Is, is it a lot of steps? Because my last church, it was it was growth track, something like that. Growth track, 14 steps. Okay, growth track. Maybe we'll do that. I, I've done that at a few churches. You see the leaves on me. Uh, they're they're nice. And I've been here a long time. I've, I've been growing a long time. Uh, you can see this. Sprouts. I mean, not as big as him, but you know, everybody's got a different destiny and different calling. And so we're here together. So you might as well just look at us the same way. And so, so we come to church and, and, we, and we sit with our family and, and we sit with our crew. And, and, then, and then, then when the service is over, you know, we shout, we, we praise, we worship. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, leaves of green. The Lord loves these leaves. And, and we worship. And then after it's over, it's taking a while tonight. We leave. The, the problem is, the Bible says those that are planted, not those that are potted. Because I don't go to one church, I go to ten. I go here on Wednesday, I go here on Thursday. I don't let much of this dirt get on me because I got dirt all inside here. And I got a wall up, a barrier. I don't really reveal much of this. I just go long enough till they start getting to know me. And then once they want to get to know me, uh, thank God I stayed in the pot. 
I don't know why I'm not really growing. I don't know why this isn't working. I don't even understand why I don't got fruit yet. I'm getting jealous of their fruit. Every time I come to church, there's fruit all around me. And I don't know why God's not producing in me. Why I'm still at the same place after 20 years. I'm not getting revelation, but they are. Maybe God loves them more. No, you just didn't read the word. Because what the word says is those who are planted. It's not just the righteous. It's what the righteous do with their life. Come on, God gave you righteousness. What will you do with that? Come on, he, he, he gave you right standing with God. And so we get in church and God says, look, I need you. I need you to believe again. I need you to trust again. I know you've been a lot of place in your plastic pot, but I need you to get out of the pot tonight and I need you to flourish. I'm desiring you to grow. I need you to get in growth track. I need you to join the marriage app. How many watched the app and didn't download it? Oh, it's no big deal. It's just another app. Well, let's make that the most important app. Let's make it more important than Instagram and Twitter. Maybe life will go a little better if you check into that app. See, we got to get out. We, we, we got to finally go, is it okay here? Is it okay here if I reveal my roots, where I've been, the things I've been hiding? The things that are, you mean you won't judge me if I have roots in the other places. Look, it's okay, baby. I got roots too. Oh. You got roots? And you don't just have roots, you got manure. Yeah. There, there's some stuff down in there. Stuff I'm dealing with. But thank God. Manure has a power to unlock the seed. Some things I've been through and gone through, and, and I'm not embarrassed of my testimony. Yeah, yeah, I have some scars. They used to be wounds, but now they're scars. Hey, come in here. Get planted next to me. Get rooted next to me. We're going to produce together. I'll help you reach for water. And when the Father comes... He'll tend to our leaves. He might remove some branches, but I'll hold you through the pain. So you could have this, and you could grow vigorously. Fruit will come, not by labor, but by planting. It will just happen. When you say, God, I'm done hiding who I am. I, look, look, God can't touch the plastic you. He can only touch the real you. Water does not get through plastic. It wants to get to the roots. God wants to feed you from the roots. He wants to. So what will it be? See, many times I've come out of the pot, and I went right back in it. Oh, man. She crazy right there. My wife, right, you know? And she's like, he's crazy over there. I barely kept all the parts of me. Praise God, I made it back. We see, we do this in marriage. We do this in friendships. This is why we're doing a marriage conference, because we can't stay in our pots. we gotta, we got to get rooted. In, this is not a consumer relationships don't work. This is covenant relationship. This is not what can you give me. This is what can I give you. But because we live in a dark, jacked up, messed up world, we jump back in our pots. I get it. There's no church hurt like church hurt. I remember when I was an intern. Trusting God, following God. The greatest hero in my life, besides Jesus, was my youth pastor. I gave him everything. I served. I was there hour after hour after hour after hour. And about three years into my internship, my pastor had a breakdown. He ended up in a bed with another woman that wasn't his wife. He didn't tell me, my senior pastor told me. I was the only intern. 
So he called me into his office and let me know the news about my hero. And he said, Jeremy, tonight we need you to preach. Preach? I don't preach. I do the PowerPoint. I hang the sheets that are cool, the tie-dye ones. I sometimes play the drums. I didn't, I didn't sign up to preach, and I'm in pain. He said, I need you to preach tonight. So I called his wife, who was also in pain. We went to lunch. I said, how are you, you going to get through this? Because I want to run. I want to walk away. She said, I forgave him. I said, you did what? She said, I forgave him. And you have to too. She said, everything he taught you, the Lord was on it. He made a mistake, but the power of God's love is going to help us to forgive him. And I said, if you're going to forgive him, I have to forgive him. I went to a Burger King because I had to write a sermon. I was an intern. I didn't have much money for a nice lunch, so I went to Burger King. I called my wife's dad, who was a pastor. And he had been through something like this. And I said, I've forgiven him, but here's what's happening. i got to preach my first sermon tonight. They're going to tell the youth ministry, and then it's me. It's not like an exciting, it's not like the best setup. So he said, okay, get a napkin. I got a napkin at Burger King. And he gave me a sermon, just like your pastor gave me 10 in the back. It was amazing. It was the best sermon I ever heard. I wrote it on that Burger King napkin. And he said, okay, now I want you to rip it up. I said, what? You just gave me the sermon. I'm preaching tonight. I didn't memorize it yet. No, rip it up. And he said, you already have a sermon inside of you. I said, pastor, I don't have a sermon. And he goes, get out of that pot. Your roots will preach better than your plastic. I came to tell someone tonight, your roots will preach better than your plastic. I came to tell someone tonight, your roots will preach better than. I said, help me, pastor. He said, okay, there's an accident on the side of a street. Two cars collide. One doesn't see the stop sign. The cars explode. I said, oh, my gosh. He said, yep, it's crazy. Something out of a movie. He said, what do you do? I said, I turn and run as fast as I can. He said, and as you're running away, you hear something, the screams of a baby. He said, what do you do? I said, I run back. He said, why would you ever do that? You don't know how to save a baby out of a burning car. And he said, oh, the fear of running away has become greater than the fear of running in. He said, tonight, there's been an accident. And God has put one man that would have the power to run in. And he's going to give him the grace to rip babies out of a burning fire. <laughs> See, I would love for God to take that story away at times. But then I realize, on the other side of that wound, it became a scar because my pain just healed you. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what God's allowed you to walk through. But let me tell you this. Sometimes on this side of the pain, we start thanking God for bringing us through it. Not that we went in it, but that he didn't leave us in the middle of the pain. That he sent that voice. That he sent that hug. That he sent that message. That he sent that tweet. That he sent... I wonder if there's someone here today that would say, man, it would be nice to walk away from the church. But it is a part of who I am. What I've been through and haven't quit, haven't stopped, proves the love of Jesus works. It works. It works. It works. It works. I love my church. I love my church. 
And God loves this church. He loves this group of people. The band can come. And I just want to take a moment. There's a guy named Jack. That's right over here, wherever Jack is. Where's Jack? Right here. No. Where'd he go? People are clapping. Oh, he's back here. Oh, there's Jack. Come here, Jack. Come here. You know, in the back, Jack, Jack said, I used to be homeless. I said, that's a nice beard. He said, I used to be homeless. I said, oh, really? Because I said, that's, that's a nice beard. It looks nice. And Jack said, I used to be homeless. I used to live in a hole 10 feet deep for three years. He said, Pastor, I'm getting married this coming up. Is it, well, how soon? I'm getting married. I didn't want to say in three days. Next month. Next month you're getting married. And Jack, he is someone that came into this house on a stretcher, on life support. God said, I can trust Jack here. Because there were some people here that said, you know what? This is going to be a hospital for the broken. This is going to be a home from, come on, Jack, you're my family. Come on, Jack. Come on, Jack. Come on, when Jack wins, you win. Come on, his wounds have become scars. You know what's crazy? Is Jack looks nothing like his past. I just wonder today, can God send more Jacks to this house? He won't send it to a potted house. He will send it only to a planted house. Come on, if you're ready to be planted in the house. Would you stand to your feet? I want to say this. There are people that while I was talking, the enemy is bringing up all kinds of wounds. You know, my mom used to have this saying, you know, whenever we get hurt, we put a Band-Aid on it in the day. And then at night, she would say, hey, son, before you go to bed, I need to rip that Band-Aid off. It's going to hurt for a second, but the air of the night is going to heal that wound. A lot of times, as believers, we live life with that Band-Aid on. God allowed it to be there for a moment so that you could begin the healing process. But there comes a moment where it comes in in a service like this. And he says, it's time to rip off the plastic. Because the only way a wound will heal and become a scar is you got to let the air hit it. The wind of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus showed up to the disciples, he said, put your hands in my wound. No, he didn't say wound. He said, touch my scars reason why God can't use you to the level yet or appoint you to the place is you still got wounds. You haven't let them become scars. Tonight, we got to take off the band-aids. It doesn't mean they didn't hurt you. It doesn't mean their hurt wasn't real. See, forgiveness is taking off the band-aid. You know what forgiveness is? It's not saying you didn't hurt me. Is saying, hey, I'm not going to live with your hurt anymore. I release you. You don't have power over me like that. I'm not for sale. Jesus freed me so that I could free you and you could free me. Tonight, is there anyone here who says, man, I need to take some Band-Aids off? Come on, if that's you, you say, man, I need, to, I, need to, I need to let go of some things. I want you just to lift your hands. If that's you, I, I've been hurt. I've been hurt in church. I've been hurt by people who said they were believers. Just lift your hand. We're going to give a moment for people to get saved. This is not the safe moment. This, this is a moment for people to get healed. If you're here and you're safe, great. But, but 
What good is your salvation without his healing? Tonight, he wants to heal you. There are even people at this altar lifted. If you need some healing, there's got to be more. There's only four hands. Come on. There's got to be more of people that say, man, I need, I need, there you go. There's some more people that say, man, I need some healing. I need to take off some band-aids. I need to forgive a few people. If I'm going to get out of this pot, come on right here. If I'm going to let out my roots, I need, I need to let go of some things. Come on, that's you. Just lift your hands. And I want you to do this. I want you to, in your hand, I want you to close it into a fist. Right there where you're at. If you're lifting your hand, I want you to close in your fist. If you're next to someone with their hand lifted, just put your hand on them. Come on, we're a family. We're, we're in here together. We're in here together tonight. This is not a consumer relationship. This is a covenant. Meaning we're not running away. We're not, we're not, we're not waiting for you to produce. We're family. We're going to say this together. Dear Jesus, tonight I forgive. Now say their name or names or organization or ministry. I forgive. Maybe you need to forgive yourself. Say, Jesus, tonight I forgive. Now say their name. Say what they did. Ah. Oh. Say, Jesus, I release them to you. Separate the pain from the memory. Use this as my testimony. Turn my wound into a scar so I could get planted in this house in Jesus name now when you're ready you're gonna open that hand and when you open that hand I want you to let out a roar of freedom a roar of joy ready on the count of three one two three hands are opening all over this room we give it to you Jesus we give it to you Jesus we give it to you, Jesus. We give it to you, Jesus. We give it to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's okay to cry. Tears do well with planted trees. Sometimes you gotta water. Sometimes you gotta water what you plant. Come on, people are watering what they plant. All of this, it's okay to water what you plant. Come on, the Holy Spirit is healing you right now. He's putting the, the tendons back together. He's putting the skin back together. He's giving you wholeness right now. He's restoring your joy right now. He's restoring your peace right now. He's restoring your trust right now. He's giving you new hope right now. He's giving you the ability, like David, to say, when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord, my heart leap for joy. He's going to give you joy about coming to church again, to be the church again. Here comes that joy. Here comes that joy. Here comes that joy. Come on, sorrow may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Here comes that joy. Here comes that joy. I love my church. I love my church. I love my church. I love my bride. I love my bride. Hallelujah. And with every head bowed and eyes closed, Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. He came to pick dead branches up off the ground and plug them into him so they would receive life. Tonight, I could give a rip if you're good or good enough or not good enough. My question is, are you dead or alive? Do you go to sleep dead? Do you wake up dead? Are you working dead? Are you trying to be a husband or wife dead? Are you trying to run that business dead? And God says tonight, I want to come in and give you life. 
If you're here tonight, you say, I need that life. Tired of waking up dead. Tired of going to sleep dead. Tired of dragging myself dead to church. I need life to the fullest. 